Hello and welcome. I'm Catherine Maggs and this is Continuing the Conversation, a conversation series dedicated specifically to continuing the conversation on the International Women's Day theme. The series is still discussing the 2022 campaign theme of Break the Bias, and I'm doing this through interviewing amazing humans around the world to better understand what Break the Bias means to them and their individual circumstances. We also look at how bias has played out in their life and what they're doing both personally and within their organisations to break the bias. And although, yes, we're now in 2023, I am continuing this theme until we work towards March 8, which is just around the corner. If you'd like to continue the conversation with me throughout 2023, then please send me a message or email. Today I am chatting with Joanne Manning. She is the Australasian Resources Leader at Arab's Global Circular Economy and a member of the Arab Australasian Regional Board. She is a fellow and engineering executive of Engineering Australia. With a particular ambition and focus on driving the principles of a circular economy and on recognising waste as a valuable resource, she works on an ongoing basis as a technical advisor to government agencies and private clients in the development of resource and circular strategy and policy and on infrastructure provision to enable circularity. She is one of the key people leading Arabs transformation of putting sustainable development at the heart of everything we do in order to meaningfully contribute to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Joanne is originally from Dublin. She lives in Brisbane with her husband, two teenage children and two Jack Russell dogs. She is an avid rugby fan and bridge player, both of which can cause her great joy and disappointment for different reasons. So please join us as we discuss the role fear and authority play in creating bias, why Ireland had the highest rate of period irregularity for a period of time, why we need to discuss counterculture, what it takes to see true cultural change, how quickly an experience can trigger a bias within us, the importance of challenging ourselves and being curious in addressing our own bias, and leaders must and should play a role in change. So let's get chatting. Welcome, Joanne, and thank you so much for being part of Continuing the Conversation, where we are continuing the conversation around Break the Bias, the key theme that came out of International Women's Day during 2022. So thank you, incredibly grateful to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Catherine. Delighted uh, to be asked to be part of this really important and, uh, and, and really fundamental conversation that needs to have. Thank you. So it is all about bias. And although obviously being part of International Women's Day, it was specifically focused on gender bias, but bias can take so many different forms. When you hear the word bias or unconscious bias, what is the first thing that comes to mind for you? Um, I think the two words come to me. One is discrimination and the other one is prejudice. Mm. So firstly, you know, we discriminate on, the, uh, on our biases. We all decide, you know, we all basically pick things over the other. We'll pick people to work with or not work with or people to socialize with or whatever. But it's, um, but it's also our prejudices. It sort of reinforces our prejudices as well. So, you know, we're more inclined to, oh, well, I, I only really like to have friends who are, you know, who have two children because I have two children. That's my, you know, that's my bias. Or, you know, I'm not, I don't understand people from a certain culture. So, I, you know, I'll have a prejudice to talk to other people when I'm on the side of the playground. And I think so much of it is, you know, inherent to our own culture, our own upbringing, you know, the environment that we that we we, we grew up in, but also the environment that we are now. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. But quite ironically, the we because of our bias, we recreate the environment we're in now based on more often than not the environment that we grew up in. So, as you say, that reinforces our bias and very hard to break out of that unless we make some very conscious choices. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I think it's interesting. I'm Irish, so you'll probably hear from my accent. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a country that, you know, when I was growing up, we were 97, 98% white Caucasian. We were over 90%, 95% Catholic. Um, there used to be sort of nearly a joke, like, how, how would you recognize someone who was not Catholic? And it's like, oh, they just look like one. Well, how does anyone look like their religion? It doesn't, <laughs> it's not, it's completely, it's a, it's a completely ludicrous statement to make. But, you know, we, we didn't know any difference. I grew up in a society where women, you know, my mother had to resign her job on marriage. So when I was growing up, everyone's mom just was at home and and the dads were we had no divorce in Ireland. We didn't hardly we, we just about had legal separation. So I didn't know anybody whose parents had separated. The dads worked in England and I only realized when I was an adult that meant you were separated. But we had such a bias. Mm -hmm. in Irish society uh, towards the family and the nucleus of the Catholic family and you know the importance of it and you know there's a whole but if you look to Ireland now in 2022 one in seven people in Ireland were not born in Ireland mm -hmm. and you know sort of a, a much smaller population you know consider themselves Roman Catholic or practice and um, they have an incredibly you know we have a the 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 former prime minister the former Taoiseach and now the current current uh, deputy prime minister Tónista is a very openly gay man you know and and we only you know Ireland was the second country in the world after New Zealand and the first country in the world actually by a plebiscite to vote for same-sex marriage yeah. so you know you can change I think that's the thing but it takes it takes you to consciously you know break the bias that's right how did growing up in such a, a um I guess I don't want to say controlled because it's not controlled but it, it, a very structured probably um, environment would be the best way to describe it. I, mean, I grew up in a, a religious family as well so quite structured but having grown up with all of that conditioning which obviously impacted your own bias and prejudices, how did that influence your bias and prejudice in adult life? I mean, leaving Ireland was one of the ways of breaking it, I suppose. Um, I married a Kiwi, so there you go, to marry an Irishman, um, which again was a, another thing. Um, but I, I, it still comes, you know, it still comes to the fore. I still find myself, you know, having like it coming through my thought process um, around certain uh, certain things or certain things that happen, um, and you can't ignore it. It's my, you know, it's what it is. It is part of me, mm. um, and it's it's part of who I am. But I think it's being conscious of what it is. I mean, I don't know whether it was. I think I think rather than being controlled, I think we grew up we grew up with a lot of fear, which was a. Um, and, and not for my parents, like my parents were never, they never instilled fear with us, but the nuns or, mm. you know, or the society, or, I mean, I remember, I remember when I was about, we were about 15 or 16, went to an all girls convent school, of course, as you did, I didn't, you know, going, there was just not a question to go to a, a same, you know, a mixed schools um, oh, and, and yeah. where I was a co-ed school. So we, I went to an all girls convent school, but actually we had a lay, we had a lay, we had a lay headmistress, we had a lay principal, which and we were one of the first Catholic girls schools, convent schools ever to have a lay principal. And she was fantastic. She, she very much girls, you can be whatever you want to be, you know, like she didn't and never put any bad sort of barriers in a way. But we did have um, someone come into us when we were 15, 16, and he was actually a priest who there was a big scandal about him in Ireland subsequently. And he to tell us that if we got into trouble, not to worry because there was places they could send us i.e. then like to a you know a mother a mother mm. and baby home essentially mm. yeah and this this would save the shame on your family mm. and this and we were absolutely petrified like you know you think about like people sort of said you know as teenagers what were you up to and we said very little we were so scared <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it was it was that fear of you know that fear of the you know of, of putting shame on your family or doing something that would you know essentially bring attention to you and um, mm -hmm. i think you know irish people don't particularly we don't we're not very good attention seekers you know we sort of are inclined to put ourselves down and you know self-praise is no praise in ireland yeah. it's quite a thing you know so it's uh so yeah so i think that you know i i mean obviously there was a lot of prejudice against things like you know the you know the the, the you know the traveling community and um, people who would have lived in you know I mean we I was sort of 
lived in a middle class family. Um, actually, we, the school, the primary school I went up and went to was a very mixed school. So we had people from social housing, people from okay. uh, so so from a so from all sorts of mixed from middle class. Although the nuns would always point out who was who. So if you went, right. to see, they would sort of you'd notice the nuns would be keeping people mm-hmm. separate. And I remember when it got to going to high school, there was a private high school and then there was a state high school and the nuns highly encouraged the kids from the social housing not to even consider going to the private high school. Wow. And that's just like ingrained bias from from authority. So you from don't authority. even question think, it. Yeah. And I think that was the thing in Ireland. I think just read an interesting book actually on Ireland from 1950s to, to, to today and it was exactly that it was ingrained bias from society mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you know most of most of the people in society were living double lives I can tell you but that's but the public persona was this you know in very much ingrained mm. sort of establishment and, and and that was how they and, and that was really how they felt that they could control society is by yeah. keeping this sort of a level, you know, level of authority and level of fear. Mm, mm. And you're forced in that kind of environment and that type of conditioning, you're forced to live two separate lives, almost like a Jekyll and Hyde, because you have to conform. Because if you don't, all the, you know, these horrible things will happen to me, or I'll put shame on my family, or I'll be extra, you know, I'll be extra, not exercise, but you know, excommunicated. Yeah, and. Yeah. And so, but that's not me. There's this, there's this other person inside just bursting to come mm-hmm. out and be something true to themselves. So yeah. it, it forces you to live in that conflict and create discontent and disharmony within yourself. Yeah, but I think one of the things which was great about Ireland was that, you know, again, in the 70s and 80s, um, they invested hugely in education. And, you know, we had quite, we actually did have foreign influence. So we were, you know, we had the BBC. And I remember we remember MTUSA coming on, which was MT, like a version of it. And they said, like, there was a whole thing about censoring. We could, we didn't see the, we didn't see Michael Jackson's thriller for about three years because they censored thriller. It was going to be it wasn't far appropriate. too appropriate. It was play, far too inappropriate. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, and there was like, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, there was still a lot of censoring going on. Mm. Um, but, but you know, we had ways and means and, 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 you know, and I think education is always the pathway, you know, yeah. sort of to, to freedom. And I think, you know, the fact that you had this very, very huge, huge youth population. I mean, I think when I was growing up, over 50 percent of the population was under 25. And, you know, it was huge and it was revolutionary. And um, we essentially educated our way you yeah. know sort of you know, out and educated our way to to, to essentially knowledge and to, to mm-hmm. open thinking and to freedom and so when i went mm-hmm. into university in 1991 there was a huge you know the student union was 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 really really powerful i mean when i give another example so when i went into uni in 1991 um, uh, the students union president was arrested for installing a condom machine in the su office <laughs> the, only oh, wow. way you could, the only way you could get contraception in those days was by going to a doctor and having a medical reason for needing it wow yeah so they yeah you know, you know what i would have loved to have being a fly on the wall to hear all of the reasons why they needed it, the medical reasons, <laughs> why oh, yeah. they needed condom. So Irish, Irish women had the highest rate of irregular periods in the world at one point. <laughs> yeah. it was the only way you could get the pill was for, was for, for, for period regulations. <laughs> <We> had like, <laughs> I think something like 30% of Irish women had to have the, uh, had to be on the pill. So look, you know, I mean, this is the sort of thing that, Oh, when you say these things now, they just sound so ludicrous. They do. But they we do. just, but we just thought it was society. We just kind of thought it was normal. We, it we was. Didn't know any- yeah, that's exactly right. It was. It was incredibly normal because that was the environment you grew up in. You knew no different. And <laughs> you know, you say education is the key, and I agree. But so is curiosity. Yeah. You've got to be curious to learn to understand. Um, mm. So the how Irish have, are always very curious. We are very curious. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good trait to have. A very yes. good trait to have. So, you know, on that, on that, you know, educating yourself and being more curious. Have you ever been in a moment where you've caught yourself acting on a bias, and kind of gone, ah? Oh. 
Yeah, oh no, absolutely. And I'll give you one actually, which was quite confronting when I moved to Australia, was, um, and I've, I'm very open about this one. So in Ireland, tradition, growing up, people who had tattoos were people you were essentially scared of, right? Or they were English people you saw when you went on holidays that you kept a wide berth of as well, <laughs> to be honest. So when I came to Australia, where tattooing was really very normalized and very prevalent, it was something I really had to readjust my own unconscious bias about. Because I, I and I remember we did an unconscious bias training course a good few years ago in Arab. And again, I kind of, you know, kind of pulled my hand and I said, look, I have to admit it. I I when I see people with tattoos, I immediately I put them in a class, I put them in a, you know, socio-demographic, and I'm a bit hesitant about them. I'm a bit scared of them. I don't yeah. really know you know, sort of what it means and why they're doing and things like that. So something obviously now, my goodness, if you had that bias in Australia now, you'd be biased against about 70% of the population. Yeah, that's true. But it was something I really, because it was, it used to just immediately trigger yeah. a, a sense and a feeling. And it was, a, you know, and it, it was a sense of unease because it was a, you know, kind of a part of society that, you know, don't, that I would be hesitant, I'd you know, give them a white birth, I would walk, you know, you'd particularly mm. a man with tattoos, mm. you know, you would, you would, you know, you sort of think, oh, they, would they, would they, could they be a threat to me, yeah. etc. So, so yeah, so that was just some, something, you know, I mean, it sounds a bit, it, sound, it sounds a bit trivial, but it was something that was something for me was quite, quite confronting for, yeah. for a while. And, and look, it's not really that trivial, because although, Australia's very accepting of it now. They weren't always. So, you know, there was a time when, you know, people that in Australia that had tattoos were, you know, yeah. they were either in gangs or they, you know, yeah. it, it indicated a, a part of society that you should fear. Yeah. So, you know, that is a bias that sits in, sat in Australia and potentially could still in, in some mm. little pockets. Yeah. But it is interesting how how we carry those with us, and as you say, you you just without even consciously thinking, you see a person tattooed, and that fear, that thought, that judgment just comes straight to the surface yeah. without a second thought. Absolutely. So, what sort of strategies do you? How do you work through those biases and and rewire that so that next time or not necessarily next time but you get to a point where you see someone tattooed and that that isn't your automatic reaction well i think it's it's i need to two things really one is i need to challenge myself and i need to actually confront my own bias and think around what are you doing why what what's what's the issue here but back to your second comment earlier about curiosity i you know it's essentially it's being curious and understanding and finding out and, and, and it's really that it was starting to have conversations and particularly I often I like to have conversations with older people who are because they're much more inclined like nowadays with the young crew like Jesus they're they're so they're I just don't know how they afford it to be honest I'm more intrigued with the younger crew about how they afford it that's generally my <laughs> question because like, <laughs> they're not cheap no they're not cheap how do you afford this full sleeve when you're 23 um, <laughs> but it's more interesting to ask older people and particularly mm. older women why why have they got a tattoo like what brought them to get this you know at the age they were and and they'll often have a a really interesting you know sort of compelling story about it and 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 i think that's you know I, and it's so i for me it's around first of all challenging myself and being willing to actually have asked the question or have the conversation and then as i said it, my curiosity kicks in then and you know and then that's uh, and you know and then i can kind of and then when i have you know, when I have essentially the information and, and, and then I can make a decision on that basis. Yes. So no, I'm much better now with the tattoos, I have to say. <laughs> Brilliant. Have you ever seen bias play out in your own career? Oh, I mean, I'm a female engineer. <laughs> so, um, yeah. It wasn't meant to be a leading question. <laughs> a leading question. Yeah, no, I look, it's, it's interesting. I've been um, talking about this quite recently and a couple of times and I 
I think maybe I'm about to be 50 and 50 next year, but I think 5 0. And it sort of, you know, makes you sort of, kind of makes you very reminiscent and, 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 and sort of philosophical, I think, about, you know, what's gone before. But I remember joining Arup actually back in, I'm with Arup maybe 24 years, I'll be 24 years with them in, in, in next year, in, in January. And, uh, you know, a leading, a leading firm, a leading international. Um, engineering consultancy, absolutely purpose, you know, purpose driven firm. And, you know, I believe, you know, from in terms of what, you know, what we have now in play, we're, we're, we're market leading, world leading in terms of, in terms of equality and, and inclusion. But, you know, when I joined back in 99, I remember um, uh, someone saying to me, they said, Joanne, look, it's like this. She said, you know, if you want to make it to the top here, if you're a man, you need to have a missus. And if you're a woman, you can't be one can't be one because yeah. all the women at the time who were in who had made it to the senior roles were all unmarried wow. never married. and that was a wow moment that was a oh my goodness like because I had you know fully intended to have you know to, to have a strong career but I really wanted to you know as well you know, God, you know, all being good I wanted to have you know a family and and you know and a partner and things and I remember thinking my goodness and and really you know the the, the you know the old saying of you can't be what you don't see but we just you know as you know as a female cohort we just couldn't see any women yeah. who had who had children and and whatever and then I remember later I was working on a project and there was this old like it was a woman at 10 oh she's probably about 15 years ahead of me 10 15 years ahead of me and she was your typical you know sort of queen bee you know like there's a yeah. name for one of us in the, yeah. <laughs> at this table essentially um and uh and uh, we had a bit of a we had a bit of a confrontation and she and um anyway I I kind of backed off and she sort of said well she said you know and I was actually pregnant with my second with my second child so I was kind of like, okay oh, you don't need this hassle and um and she said to me she said well she said if you return to work after you have your baby we'll you know we can have a discussion and I said I said what do you mean if I said when I said I said I was a you know I was an engineer for 12, 13 years before I have my first child and now I'm having my second. This isn't an if conversation, this is a when conversation. And she just said, oh, well, I could just never um, realize the whole children and career. So I just didn't have any. Hmm. And but that was really common. That was really, you know, this yeah. was so they were they were like, I mean, I think, you know, there was a whole cohort of women in engineering. They were like nuns to engineering. <laughs> yeah. And look, not just Never not mind. just en- not just yeah. engineering, um, the financial services industry, the like it that Queen Bee phenomena was um across many different Mm. industries where it was historically a male dominated industry I have a question for you though when you first started 24 years ago and you were told that you stayed did why because I'm a fighter I'm a that's I'm that's just give me a challenge and that's (laughs) that's just my personality (laughs) all right okay that's a challenge that needs to be overcome and and I did and I yeah. but what I did do Catherine was that I I knew I knew I had to get myself to a certain point in my career mm. and and at that point then you know if I you know that point I knew in those days I knew once I had kids my opportunity for promotion or working on projects whatever was going to dissipate so I worked oh my god I worked my socks off for you know seven eight years mm. and and then grace my daughter was born in 20, 2006 but i kind of knew knew going in at that i wouldn't get there's no way you would get you would you'd be promoted or you know when you were pregnant you were definitely not getting it on maternity leave and you were you were and you were probably not going to get it you know mm. so it's going to take you a year because you were going to have to demo you know you'd have to be back and if you went part-time then again, you know, I was talking to a lady actually, I did a thing last week and I was talking to a lady who was in our, like in the late nineties, early thousands. And um, she said she, she got promoted on when she came back from having her first child and she was working a three or four day week. And one of the senior people told her she didn't deserve it because she was working part time. It's just crushing, yeah, that, isn't it? Thank, oh, look. You know, and can it, I just say, make it really clear that it's gone, completely gone. Yeah. We have no penalty leave. I was actually, I was involved in overhauling the whole parental leave policy 
in Australia when I came down here mm. and I had done it in Ireland, came here and did it here. And, uh, and one of the big, the, one of the big things I wanted to do when, when, when we were, when we were looking at, re- when we were looking at overhauling the whole parental leave policy was to really introduce this sort of, con- really to embed this principle of no penalty leave. Because it was one thing about, it was one thing about being paid the maternity leave or being paid, but the bigger issue was, is you were being penalized for mm. it. And yeah, that was the thing we had to them, because that was the reason women were leaving. Mm. It wasn't they weren't leaving because they only got 16 weeks instead of 20 weeks maternity pay. They left because when they came back, they were being put on terrible projects or mm. they were they saw Joe, who they were always ahead of, now ahead of them. Because yeah. you know, and 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 the opportunity or like you know, the common one was like they, you know, a, a, a really cool project would come up. But, you know, the woman was working a four day week, wasn't working on a Monday. And they go, no, well, you can't, you can't be on this project. And it was like, why can't I be on this? Oh, but the site meetings are always on a Monday. And it was like, I remember ringing. We could have moved them to a Tuesday, God forbid. Well, I remember a woman coming to me and she had, there was, she was the best candidate. Like she was the, absolutely the most qualified person to do this project. And she said to me, they won't do it because the meetings are on a Monday and I work a four day week. And I said, I just rang the project director and I said, is there any reason this can't be on a Tuesday? Oh, but we always do side meetings on a Monday. And I know, but is there any reason why they couldn't be on a Tuesday? But that's the, always the way it's been, but we could change it. Mm-hmm. And said, I'll ring the client if you want. And I rang the client and, oh, you know, the man was, oh, and I rang the client and I said, okay, you know, we want Jane to work on this project, but she doesn't work Mondays. Oh, I really want Jane to work on this project. That's why, so you're willing to move the site meetings to Tuesday? Because, oh yeah, absolutely. Not a problem. Yeah, not but a problem at all. willingness to even mm. ask. Yeah. So yeah. So you know, and so the old, so the so so back to the idea of no penalty leave became mm. really really important because yeah. you know, um, and like in Australia when I came over, women when they went on parental leave used to be um, um, deactivated from the systems. <laughs> so when it came to like you know pay reviews or promotions or whatever, they weren't even on a list. Wow. Well, so <laughs> so they were taking they were completely as if they weren't there. Well, if they weren't there, they were, and they didn't, wow. so their leave didn't count for long service leave. They didn't get, you know, they didn't get any profit share on it. They didn't get any, the big issue was they didn't get any superannuation payments on yeah. it. Huge issue. And, it's, and this is a great example of how bias just normalizes behavior. If yeah. there's enough people that believe the same thing, it just becomes, not only does it become normalised, it becomes ingrained in your policy. I want to ask you the question, you said, you know, that was 24 years ago, and, and but now it's, everything's equal, it, that's all gone. What was the road to that? What had to happen to see those changes? Not just talk about them and say, we're doing it, but actually see those changes culturally occur. What happened? Um, I, I, so I think a couple of things happened. One is that a very strong cohort of females started progressing through the firm. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, particularly in Europe, there was, you know, in the early 2000s, there was a really conscious sort of jurisdictional shift. You know, there was, you know, at a society level, there was this realization that half, half of the talent pool, you know, was not, was not available and you know we were in a booming economy ireland was in the early 2000s was absolutely booming we had you know less than three percent unemployment and things so if you didn't have you know if you had 50 percent of the population not not available then you know we were not going to achieve the economic outcomes we had so mm-hmm. and then i think there was also this realization that we you know we as i said i said earlier that you know ireland was an incredibly educated you know, population but why were you educating all these people for 10 years down the way just to fall out mm. didn't make any sense economically mm. again doesn't make any sense at all so i think at a at a at a at a, at a state level at a sort of a national level there was a big shift and um, you had countries like norway sweden denmark we all hear the scandinavian countries leading mm. the way but they really genuinely led the way um 
but at the same time, you know, it needed, you needed to, people needed to start seeing it. So what we had, particularly in, in, in our firm, was that there was starting to be a cohort of females that were making, were starting to make it through. Don't get me wrong, it was really hard work. Mm. And, you know, and I and now when people sort of say like, oh, you know, isn't it great you got such as, like I got appointed to the board in Australasia in April this year. And, you know, and, and someone said to me, they said, oh, it's great to see more women on the board, isn't it? Like, is <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I don't think it's just because I'm a female, you know, that I need it. Yeah, and that's still, unfortunately, that's still a common yeah. thought. We had to work harder, longer, be better yep. to even just get, just to even then to be just on to even the field. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, Which in itself is unfair. It is, it is unfair. Yeah. And so now, and I, but I also think, um, thankfully as well, another thing that has made a difference, hopefully, or maybe I'm, or maybe I'm self-praising myself, which is no praise. But as I said, when I, I actually was really fortunate, I had an amazing woman who was my, was, who was my boss and was my, my leader when I was in Ireland, when after, when I joined, she, and she was like, she was like the headmistress, she was like the principal school. She, you know, she just said, you, you know, we had a, the number of us females she just was very much girls you can be anything you want to be you know like and she would she was fantastic a really really strong sponsor as well as well as leader yeah. but I think what happened though as well is is that we are much much more my generation is far more generous than the previous generation was mm. was to us yeah and I think that is making a huge difference and, and all of a sudden there is now a cohort of females coming into engineering and whatever, and they can see what they want to be. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's massive. It's absolutely it is. massive. It is. You, you've done all that hard work, but you've made the path easier for the next generation. Yeah, it's still hard. Don't get me wrong. It's really oh hard. no, because we're still women. fighting. The, the the fact that we're still having the conversation, <laughs> we're still fighting the battle. We are. We are. But my my um. My 14 year old, you know, um, last year said to me, he said, why do we have International Women's Day? Like, why do you need a day? <laughs> well, men do have a day. There's one in September yeah, for men. I know, but he, you know, I think the, the Men's Day doesn't get quite the same attention, you know, sort of attention <laughs> and, 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 and media attention as the, as the women's day. And I said, well, I said, when women and men have complete equality and in society, and there is no barriers for for women, mm. you know, on equal pay, equal rights, equal representation, equal everything. We won't need it anymore. And to his credit, this year, because he goes to an all boys school, and this year, seemingly one of the boys in his class stood up and went, "Why do we have this International Women's Day?" Because they celebrate in school, and he stood up and he went because, and he said what I had said, which yeah. I was very proud of. Him. Yeah. Do you have two boys or just the one? No, I have one boy and one girl. How do you have, what sort of conversations do you have with them about, you know, gender bias, um, you know, gender role stereotypes, all that kind of stuff? How do you have, what sort of conversations do you have with them to help educate oh. them? Well, I mean, they're, they've got a mom who was a, you know, a female engineer, played women's rugby, had three older brothers. <laughs> they just shake. They just, I think they're more afraid to have the conversation that they're, oh, no, mom's going to go. Oh. She's going to get on her rant. <laughs> mom's going to go on a rant. Don't go there with her. Oh, no, I, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I need, well, really what's more important, I mean, particularly for my, for my daughter and um, my daughter is actually also on the autism spectrum. So we, yeah. you know, it's a double, double, double bias, you know, for mm, her. Yeah. So, you know, it's trying to nearly like, you know, with her, I feel I'm on this journey of now fighting a whole new set of prejudices mm. and bias and, and, yeah. you know, and, and having her be it's 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 she's really scared to tell a lot of people because mm -hmm. a lot of as as girls a lot of them are high fun you know high functioning and quite social yeah but you know but you know but you know she's very much on the autism spectrum and we're trying you know trying to trying to trying to let her be brave to try and tell people and actually in in you know to her credit she went for an interview for a little part-time job last weekend and um and she came out of it and she says mom i told them Oh, bless. 
And I said, and, and I said, okay, and what did they react? They said, oh, no, that's, we'll work around that. And she's going for a trial this week. And, you know, and, and the shift, they said, we'll just make sure you shifts would only be three hours and whatever, whatever. And um, because, you know, um, and I'm so proud of her for doing yeah, that. Amazing. Huge step for her to do it. But like, it's a really scary, like, could you like really, really scary to, it to is. you know, the, the, the uh, the bias you know yeah. against it and i know there's you know the media and tv and everything and you know with between elon musks and everything else but you know a lot of people just don't understand it and particularly the older generation have no idea of what it what, what it really means and how it no. impacts and it's no. yeah so and you know the elon musks and all the rest of it you know they made their millions and proved themselves before they shared that yeah exactly so yeah. It, it's hard, especially as a as a teenager in this world that we live in. This twenty four hour hyper vigilant. Um, you're putting your heart on your sleeve. You're you, you're stripping yourself right back and showing all your vulnerabilities. Yeah, no, it is. It's. I agree. I I I, I I'm glad I did my teenage years when I did it. Mm. I don't I don't envy them doing that. And look, with my son, it's very much around. You know, having respect for women. I I think there's this counterculture now going on that you know some men think they're now the victims, which yeah. really they're not. But there is there is a there is definitely a you know a, a, a counterculture I think with yes. regard to that and just making sure that he realizes that he's you know he is he has not been victimized. He has not been sort of you know sort of biased against. It's just that they've even the playing field. Yeah. Yeah, and it's good, but it's good that he comes to you with those questions, right? Why? Yeah. Why is there an International Women's Day? Because it can be very easy to, even within organisations, when they're trying to create that equality, equality of pay, equality of, of um, you know, promotion, etc. It's very easy if it's not handled in the right way and communicated in the correct way. It's very easy to kind of have that, tipping point where people go well hang on a minute what about us now we're being discriminated against and that's not just the men right it could be any minority or any bias that exists within human society yeah why do you think it's so important for us to break the bias to become more conscious aware of consciously aware of of what our biases are and break them down well if we don't break them down, we just keep repeating what we've always done. Society will not change, mm. you know, and all the the you know, the issues that have had in society or, you know, the, the, the challenges that, you know, the women face in particular. So there's I mean, I think, you know, the um, last year with the you know, with the lean in and, you know, the domestic, you know, the whole violence against women and, you know, between Brittany Higgins and then there was the Ashley O'Halloran, the, the the poor young teacher in Ireland who was, mm. you know, attacked and killed out for a jog at 3.30 mm. in the afternoon on the Monday after teaching a group of seven year olds. She was a primary school teacher mm. and she was out just exercising, you daylight. know, on, on daylight at 3.30 in the afternoon. Mm. And we have to we have to break this we cannot there is no acceptance to violence to women under any circumstances there is no acceptance for people to prey on other people because they're in a more senior position yeah. and you know the woman is you know the young woman is you know is yes she's ambitious but the, the, this sort of you know mentality by certain you know by certain men that you know that they can essentially take complete advantage and and essentially use you know prey on this i just this this sort of stuff has to stop and we have to and i think this is why we have to consciously raise this and we have to consciously break it and unfortunately what ends up happening is is that there's you know for the 99 good stories there's the one not so good or there's the one that you know that you know whatever happens and then media just you know everyone just targets in on the one and then the point you know the 99 then gets you know sort of it gets impacted and everything else and like i think the you know i'm i'm, I'm glad to see that like you know particularly you see in a lot of you know sort of court cases now where if the if the woman was under the influence or something that you know case is still going through just because you've you know you're under the influence doesn't it doesn't allow someone to take advantage no. of you no. just because you're in a senior role 
um, you're a you know, you're a you're a senior person to a junior a junior female does not allow you to take advantage of it. But you know, um, no, it, it, there's no, there's yeah, there is. And, and if and anything, you've got more responsibility. Have more responsibility to look after those people. Yeah, but I think that's that's part of it. I think leaders need to realize and embrace the fact that they are leaders and that comes with the responsibility yeah and we know you know i I mean every firm every organization in the world does surveys of their staff and you know and and a common one is leaders don't deal with bad behavior or my leader has the inability to do well actually leaders have to realize that you know when you get this role to be a leader it comes with a huge amount of responsibility and and, accountability and accountability yeah yeah and that's a big that's a that's a big one for me um and you know and i think we need to you know the next you know if we don't consciously change things we just you know as we said earlier on we just we just play and repeat play and repeat play mm-hmm. and repeat mm-hmm. so um and uh, so therefore you know so yeah so that's why this um breaking actually calling it out raising it you know even the stupid things of what do you mean that is that an issue yeah it is an issue you know like you know, yeah. and not, you know, there's a there was a thing recently around um, uh, female site workers and the fact that they just don't do PPE in the sizes that you know the in you know for you know for smaller you know for for more petite women and then a company came out and started making PPE for mm. for women but like so the poor woman was going around in a you know a shirt and a pair of pair of shoes that were three sizes too big for her yeah it's and and that goes to you know one of the the importance of of being breaking those bias in in our frameworks in our policies in the way we design things i mean that's a perfect example of we've always made it for men so yeah and not even thinking that we've got women on so how long have we had women on site for and we're only just going oh maybe we should make it in their size maybe we should make it in their size exactly um you know and and look thinking you know there is when we now get to you know it's not just designing things for women we need to be designing things for full disability access yes you know for and that's that's not just people in wheelchairs that's for people you know for all you know people who are visually impaired you know people who have you know hearing difficulties etc there is a cisgender for exactly yeah yeah and look don't get me wrong this is creating a whole level of complexity in the world that (laughs) we didn't because we were no idea, we weren't aware of them, or we didn't acknowledge them, or 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 you know, well, we created years ago. Yeah, well, man created two two gender stereotypes. Like that's not biological. Male female is biological. We have socially constructed male female, and when that was created, I guess that was probably all that was accepted even though we know for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years there's been homosexual relationships i mean it's it's in history um but there was no acceptance of it necessarily um and transgender as well yeah Yeah. everything exactly it's it's always existed Mm -hmm. however society and the way we've societal construct has created our own bias and influenced our own bias we just didn't, as you say, didn't see it. And if it was different to male, female, then we were scared of it. We didn't understand it. And there was something wrong with you, not us. Exactly. Mm. It's, um, it's certainly a fascinating topic and I'm incredibly grateful to have you, um, with me today talking through it all. It's, it's been absolutely fabulous. I've really enjoyed talking all things about bias with you today, Joanne. Thank you. It's been great. Really enjoyed it.